So $15 is a really good price uh, for all you can eat. So if you're, if you're so welcome or change your mind and have to sign up, maybe you have your class. Did you, did you ask uh, the, the class that's out in the gym area about signing up? No, because there were some people. It was last wide. It was our type of class. We could have. In, we could have. You, you weren't going to invite other people. Well, we, we it was going to be our class. It was going to be our class breakfast. Uh -huh. We we sure could have done that. Some of our class are I did uh, the ones that are attending the women's class. I tried to catch all of them because they're really in our class. They're just we haven't had a quarter of them. Yeah. But you know, in retrospect, we we could have done the uh, the uh, the cornerstone too because yeah. they invite us. That are in that age group. So oh, yeah. I thought Cornerstone was a lighter. No, this is just going to be a lamp lighter. Yeah. Uh, they have something going on just soon after. Yeah. Yeah. Very close. So that's okay. Yeah. We need that folder, don't we? Yeah. 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 All right. Speaking of, <laughs> thank you, Kenneth. Speaking of Cornerstone, they've asked uh, that I pass this around. This is for their social event on the 28th. If you signed up previously, you need to sign up again because they lost their uh, sign-up sheet. <laughs> so, that, that might be indicative of the cornerstone class. Okay, here we go. Pass that around. And ours. And ours. And ours. Could be. All right, here we go. Today we're looking at Isaiah chapter 53. This is the third time, the third lesson that we've had in Isaiah 53. And today we're looking at verses 9 through 12, and you'll see there on your uh, outline... Uh, that the first lesson we talked about was how the Messiah suffered. The second lesson was why the Messiah suffered. And today, it's results of his suffering, uh, which is his exaltation. So, you'll see at the top, the title of the lesson is The Triumphant Suffering of Messiah. Um, do you see that lesson title as sort of oxymoronic? In other words, a contradiction in terms. When we think of suffering... We don't usually think of triumphant. So uh, anyway, I thought that was an interesting title, The Triumphant Suffering. What are some other examples of pain followed by pleasure that you can think of? Childbirth? Yeah. Bingo, there's the number one. I, mean, I can't speak to that, but I understand. Yeah, that's the number one. Okay, what else? Anything else? Probably like sports. Yeah, hard sports that you have to like, you win. Exercise. I put exercise down, and of course, Alan Good is not here today, but of course, <laughs> he's the recipient of um, kind of a lot of pain. He didn't get the pleasure part back because he does have, ro we could have prayed for Alan, he does have to have rotator uh, mm -hmm. surgery, I believe. Okay, so anything else you think about? Toothache. Well, sure. you, you, have the, you have the three that I put down, and the one I put down specifically was wisdom teeth. <laughs> because two weeks ago I had one taken out. So, yes, I had the pain and still working on getting the pleasure part of that. But I guess ultimately it's for your good dental health. So anyway, yeah, those are some good I, those are some good results. All right, let's read the lesson, and then um, we'll start to study. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 9 through 12. I'll read this, and... The, I'm using the um, New Revised Standard Version, which might be different than yours, and I'm going to read an alternate version when we get into the lesson of verse 11, because that's a very difficult verse. The pastor always gives me these lessons where it's a hard, it's a hard translation, uh, a lot of corrupted um, manuscripts from the old original manuscripts, so hard to translate, so here we go, verse 9. They made his grave with the wicked, and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, 
because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. All right. So the first result, and this we won't spend long on this, verse 9, the first result uh, of Messiah's suffering was that he received an honorable burial. An honorable burial. You know, it talks about the Romans, uh, I think, were sort of planning that he would just be buried with the wicked, the uh, two thieves that were on the cross beside him. But um, the Lord had a plan. And so he ended up being buried uh, in a rich man's tomb. Okay, that's a very straightforward and uh, simple one. Now, the second result of Christ's suffering, verse 10, uh, again, it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. So the second result was the Father's satisfaction. Because his bruising, his crushing, some, some translations say he was bruised, some say he was crushed. Because his bruising, crushing was pleasing. Why was God pleased by the death of his spotless son? Why do you think God was pleased by the death of his spotless son? His desire to obey his father's will. <clears throat> okay. That sin be finally put away. That's the only way it could have been done. Okay. Um, okay. Had to be somebody spotless, and certainly he wasn't one of us. Uh, well, wouldn't be me anyway. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Okay. I think that's right. Good. Anything else? The two things um, that I wrote down, and you don't have to write these down, but the two things I wrote down was it was a perfect expression of his love for people, okay, of God's uh, love for people. And then, um, God doesn't delight in sending people to hell. So Christ's death provides a way of escape from that destination. So... Uh, that might be why God was pleased by the death of his son. And, and you all alluded to those ideas. And so, um, who can know the mind of God? But we're postulating that those might be things that uh, would have pleased God uh, by the sacrifice of his son. Okay, so that's the first thing. The first um, uh, item there under his father's satisfaction. The second thing is, because his days are prolonged. You see that it's sort of the middle of the verse. Uh, what is this referring to? Because his days are prolonged. What do you think? As you think of Christ and his days being prolonged, what do you think? His resurrection. Bingo. Okay. This is referring to Christ's resurrection. Do you think Isaiah understood this prophecy as he was right as he was making this? <laughs> Go ahead and speak out, Jim. Don't just shake your head. No. <laughs> he might have had a clue because of uh, the, um, the Enoch that was uh, taken. Okay. Maybe he had maybe that thought. Did he have knowledge of that? You know, I don't know if we know or not. But he wasn't really dead, though, because he was taken when he was alive. I didn't, I didn't see a lot of... I saw somebody shake their head like this, which I assume means they don't think that I, they understood that. Do we have anybody who thinks, yeah, like this? They couldn't have known back then what they were talking about because it hadn't happened. It was totally foreign to their idea of what was going to happen. And kind of a new thought, wasn't it? Who, who knew about resurrection in Isaiah's day? Um, okay, well, let's look. Somebody, uh, I have these four references here. So somebody find Psalm 1610 for us and read that, please. 
This is a sort of a messianic verse from Psalms. All right. Um, so, how do we make light of? Uh, how do we understand this verse? This is David, of course, speaking, um, and not speaking of himself. We assume because David died and saw a decay. Okay, so we take it here that uh, he's talking here about. The Holy One, and we see that as a prophecy, perhaps, of Jesus. Anybody, do we have an agreement about that, that this is a Messianic verse? Well, you can even put in there David when he said, uh, prayed after he lost his son. Remember, he had said, I will see him. Okay. So that that is a resurrection. You know, okay. He was dead. He, must, he believed in the afterlife. Okay, yeah. so, so now we have... We have a little bit of thought here of, well, maybe some people had thoughts that there was an afterlife of some kind. Mm -hmm. So um, is, there, is there this resurrection here? In this verse, anyway, it implies that there's something about that. But did, I, did Isaiah know? I, you can't know the mind of Isaiah. But it's just an interesting, probably in some ways a meaningless thought, but it's something to think about. These guys wrote these words. Did they really comprehend fully what this might mean uh, thousands of years later? Okay. Someone find 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 17 to 23, and please then read that for us, if you will. And somebody can be looking up these next few and have them ready when we're there, so we don't take a lot of time. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came to a man, the resurrection of the, of the dead also comes also to a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Okay, so what does this passage say to us? Or what might it say to us? You saw the concepts there of death and life. So what does it mean? What does it say? What might it say? We have hope because of Christ. Uh, Right, we have hope because of Christ's resurrection. resurrection. So, uh, although the death was important, and why was it important? Somebody had to make the perfect sacrifice for us. So let's let's not um, make light of the suffering that was crucial, but the resurrection uh, also. Is just as important as the substitutionary death. So we want, we want to keep those two things together. All right. So given that there is a resurrection, uh, who are the offspring or the seed that it talks about in there? He shall see his offspring. Who are the offspring? Us, the believers. Us, believers, born again Christians. <coughs> And of course, the question that is during our time, <laughs> if you're a Christian, we assume you're born again. Okay, so yeah, so we're in agreement that uh, he will he will see his offspring, meaning those who who have chosen to believe. Okay, third thing. What's the third thing that was, that it talks about in there, at the end of the verse? That fits one, two, three, four, five, six blanks. <laughs> well, at the end of the verse, it talks about the will of the Lord shall prosper. Okay? Uh, God was pleased with Christ as he did the will of the Father. Okay? Well, aware 
that. So, uh, somebody read for us Revelation 13 8. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from the creation of the world. Okay, the last part being the crucial part, belonging to the Lamb who was slain when? From the creation of the world. From the creation of the world. Okay, so that was a long, rather long-standing plan. Okay, uh, Matthew 26, 39 to 42. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, <coughs> your will be done. All right. So uh, we see that as sort of a confirmation of the will of the Lord shall prosper. Okay? And... Perhaps it reaffirms that was there really a choice? Did Jesus really have a choice? No. Not for our sake. Uh, yeah, kind of a rhetorical question in a way. Uh, there was a plan from the creation and it was fulfilled. Okay. Notice that in verse 10 the triumphant suffering in this verse. Okay? And I and I wrote it out there for you. The crushing, the bruising, vis-a-vis uh, -vis against the prologue, the, the triumph, the resurrection. Okay? So uh, that, I thought that was a nice um, thing to just observe about that verse. Okay. Um, the third result of Christ's suffering and resurrection was, we'll read verse 11, and this is the corrupted verse that is translated many different ways, or some different ways in different Bibles. And of course, it always leads me to this. I don't have a lot of trouble with the inerrancy of the Bible, but I have more trouble with people who have an inerrant interpretation of the Bible. So, I try to be open to various kinds of reading. So I'm going to read verse 11 differently than I did earlier. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. My Bible says he shall see light, but we can maybe take out the word light. Out of his anguish he shall see and he shall find satisfaction. Period. Many Bibles end with a period there. Through his knowledge the righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous and he shall bear their iniquities. That's probably a more conventional reading and probably a better Perhaps a better interpretation, at least easier to understand. Okay, so the third result of Christ's suffering was, in verse from verse eleven, freedom from death. Um, after that, well, because of that, many were saved. The salvation of many. The salvation of many. Okay. So, what do we do with the word knowledge? Because okay, that's sort of a tricky word in there, and one that maybe, uh, at least I didn't know for sure what that meant, but it talks about his knowledge. So, um, is this knowledge that Christ possessed, or is it knowledge of Christ that is necessary for justification? So, should we think of both? How many think it's Knowledge that Christ possessed. How many think it's knowledge that we have to have? Knowledge of Christ. We've got a couple votes on that one. Three. Okay. Well, I looked up a couple commentaries just to get an idea about it. So number one says, by his knowledge, that is by the knowledge of himself, God's righteous servant justified. So there's option number one. Option number two by the knowledge of him as our Savior shall a righteous one, my servant, furnish justifying righteousness unto the many. So there it would be option B. It's knowledge of Christ uh, that is necessary for justification. So 
you can choose the one you like, and they might both be true, but in any event, it helps to understand, perhaps helps us to understand the knowledge word that's in there um, as we think about uh, Christ. Okay, and then secondly, in that um, verse, note the word, um, note also the word many, okay? Um, shall make many righteous. So, by implication, then, what word cannot be there? All. All. I prefer that we think of it as all. Just so we're well aware of that, that not all will be righteous. Okay? <clears throat> now, so we didn't know that, but just to affirm that. Okay, so that talks about... Um, uh, out of his anguish, you see that in the first part of that verse, out of his anguish, many will be made righteous. So, do you agree that in today's world, for a person to be born again, someone else has to toil, strain, struggle, and work? That's what Jesus did, okay? He talked about toiling, straining, working. What do you think about that? Okay, and that and leaving someone there is that work? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, is that toil? Is that strain? Um, yes. Yeah, I have a little trouble with saying they have to because yeah. that makes it that that looks like a work salvation thing. Yeah. Okay. So it, it, it happens yeah. frequently, but it's you know it has to because God can speak to people. Uh, through creation, you know, people that don't have the word of God. Okay. You know. So there's a direct revelation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but perhaps, mm -hmm. rather than through the work of someone else. Mm -hmm. Okay. If that were all, uh, mm, careful. <laughs> if that were always the case, then we we could dispense with missionaries. Would that be the case? Because oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> because they're toiling and straining and working, right? You dispense with scripture, then, because you okay. can there in scripture. Right. Okay. No, no, I don't. I don't think. But I, I wanted to see if we do we see do we see that as um, as a requirement? And I hear what Ken said. Well, you know, it's not a works. I think based, what Ken uh, says, yeah, you, you creation is a witness, and it should make you start questioning. To dive into it more, but just looking at salvation or creation won't bring you to salvation. Okay. It's his it's his word that saves us, not not okay. the pastor preaching or you teaching or correct. Um, so we yeah. know God uses us and uh, to do bring his word. I'm just saying it's not. The work is a requirement. Someone has to tell them. Somebody has to work. You still have to tell them. They still have to hear. But the salvation isn't from the work, and it isn't the yeah, work no. of the person who is being saved. It, but I have to do. I have to tell you. Somebody has to tell you. That's work. We you know, all said it in the New Testament. Testament. Yeah. How will they know if they don't hear? Yeah. And how will they wow. hear if somebody tells them? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like it. Okay. Um, well, we know that Christ toiled and strained and suffered uh, in order that many would be saved. Whether that's still, now that that's been done, you know, maybe it's not always that way, but um, it does seem like there's a lot of work that goes into someone receiving salvation. I'm thinking of the Bedfords, for example, and Vacation Bible School, okay? There's a lot of work and toil and strain, I presume. And the, uh, the hope, of course, is that some will come to salvation. And so it, it, it didn't just, it won't just happen. It doesn't just happen. Boy, somebody is putting forth an effort. So something to think about, uh, not that God can't work directly, Generally, uh, probably somebody did something. Okay, note again the triumphant suffering described in this verse. The anguish, okay, 
out of his anguish, that's the very beginning of the verse, and then the righteous, okay, will make many righteous. So there's, the, again, uh, the suffering uh, and the triumph. Okay, uh, verse 12. Um, Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Mm -hmm. So what is a fourth result of Christ's suffering and resurrection? <clears throat> Just throw out some words that you think you might have an honor. All right? I use the word glorification. You can use whatever word you want. Okay, that's one. What else happens? There's a straight regurgitation out of the verse. Intercession. Okay, so a fourth result of Christ's suffering is his glorification and his intercession. Now note in verse 12, and I'm not a theologian, but I, uh, I believe it, it may be fair to say this is God uh, speaking, therefore I will allot him. So this is not necessarily Isaiah speaking uh, as Isaiah, but speaking, God is speaking uh, there pretty directly. So how was Christ glorified? <clears throat> sat down by the right hand of God. Okay. Uh, that's B. His position at the right hand of God. Before that, how was he glorified? This is New Testament now. Okay. How was he glorified? By raising from the dead. Uh, yeah, and after that, what happened? Uh, ascension. Okay. So the words that I'm using there are ascension, and position. Okay. So, um, just by way of trying to understand the verse, um, I will allot him a portion with the great. So, how do we interpret the word great? What are some definitions or ideas associated with that word when we think of great? Like king. Uh, king. Honor, majesty, royalty, um, as being with God in heaven. Okay? Great. That's one kind of great. What's another kind of great? Well known. Uh, yes. I sort of put that with, with A. Uh, in a whole nother way, what do we think of when we think of great? Big. Yes, and a lot. A lot. Uh, we're getting warm now, a lot. <laughs> okay, <laughs> number. Okay, I'm thinking number there, okay? He, uh, I will allow him a portion with the great Okay, as being a part of all the redeemed. Okay, that's a great number of, of people. Okay, so, not that I'm any kind of a Greek scholar, but the commentaries, uh, uh, again, it's, it's both ways. Some say, oh, no, it's A, and some say B. But the one commentary, you saw I put that little Greek word, or a little uh, Hebrew word in there, whatever, translation word, harabim, if that's how you pronounce it, is apparently the same word that's used in verse 11 for many, okay? Um, shall make, in verse 11 it says, shall make many righteous. And then here, apparently, maybe it's this very same word. So that particular person um, erred on the side of it's talking about a number. But uh, it, others say, no, it, it refers to his position, his current position, his residing as as uh, in honor, majesty, and royalty, and ultimately as, of course, king sitting on the throne. Take it for what you want, 
I'm just trying to throw out some options for you to maybe help you understand that verse. Okay, um, who divides the spoil? A conquering king. Okay, so that's pretty standard. We are familiar with that from history and all that kind of thing. Okay, so who receives the spoil? The servants, the workers. Okay, yeah, in, in human terms. So in spiritual terms, uh, who will divide, who receives the spoil? Those who are joint heirs with Christ, okay? Short form, the short form of that is we Christians. <laughs> okay, but the long form is those who are joint heirs with Christ. Okay, so for whom, it says, uh, intercession is the end of the verse, for whom is Christ interceding? Okay. Anything else? Sinners. Yeah, okay. Transgressors, sinners. So those who put their belief in him. Okay. Again, we have the two sort of um, ends of the spectrum, I guess you might say. So, uh, do you believe Christ intercedes both for those who reject him? And those who receive him. What do you think about that? Only those that receive him. Okay. There's a there's a his blood is only on them. Okay. So they will be saved by the person from them that reject him. Yeah. Okay. Only those who receive him. Okay. Any other thoughts about that? And of course, I'm giving you a clue in the next <laughs> in the next statement. Okay, so what about his words on the cross? Father, forgive them. They hadn't received him, I don't think. The Roman soldiers, uh, the, and, and I don't know who he was referring to there. Was it just Romans, the people who crucified him, or um, the Jewish leaders who organized this and made it happen? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know the answer there for sure. I don't know who, but, but the implication to me is that he interceded at that instant in time. For people who had rejected him. Who am I to say? But it's something to think about. Was that for one sin or all sin? So. Um, yeah, uh, who, who's to say? Um, at that instant in time, it was for what we uh, presume it was for what happened at that time. Sure. Yeah. Was he asking for God's forgiveness for them? for eternal salvation or was he asking for God's forgiveness to them for killing him because frankly they all deserve the same uh, treatment that Corin Dathan got in other words the earth could have swallowed him up or lightning could have come down and killed all those there when he died yeah. and God in that respect forgave them there were no immediate repercussions but I don't think he gave salvation to those people who obviously did not believe okay I, I'm, I'm, I like that discussion because <laughs> what what does that what did those words mean? He also said for they don't know what they're doing. There's a lot of things that people do know that they're doing, and that wasn't the prayer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. He didn't say forgive them for everything they've done. That's what just forgive them for what they're yeah. not what they don't know they're doing right now. Yeah. I think that's yeah. But the statement of killing his son is a good thing uh, because, yeah, you think of it, God dying, there should have been judgment right there, killing the Holy One. And so Christ intercepting for just that point in time for, that, for his death. Okay. Otherwise, all would have known that Christ was the Son of God 
not just by faith, but by sight because of the whole the, what could have happened. Could have happened. Could have changed some things. Yeah, that could have been a wild day. Could I mean it was a wild day, but <laughs> it could have been. Yeah. yeah. Well, on one level, they knew what they were doing. They knew they were killing a person, but they don't. I don't think they didn't have any of the deep ramifications of. Oh yeah. Well. Different. So, and the Pharisees did not, would not believe Jesus was real. They refused. Even though do they we, okay, so do we think the Pharisees didn't know who he was, and in spite of that went ahead and crucified him, or because of that, or they didn't know who he was? I think they knew. Or wouldn't believe it. I think they knew. They just didn't want to. That's why they didn't answer some of his questions. Well, they didn't want to lose their power. Yeah, exactly. He was bad for business. He was really bad for business. Yeah. 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 yeah he, he, was, he was causing a problem for them. Okay. The status quo was really uh, right. really going down the tubes. So it was a tough thing. Well, uh, I appreciate all that discussion because I don't really know the answer either. <laughs> <laughs> but it's something to think about. What did Jesus mean at that time? And maybe, yeah, it just meant forgive them for what they did here, but but they didn't, but they're not believers in me. You know, I'm, I mean, they're not receiving salvation through this. You know, who, how do we know? Um, the thief on the cross, did he receive salvation, the one that was malice him? Yes. yes. He wasn't just forgiven for something on that instant in time. He received salvation. Do we believe that? Yes. Does everybody believe that? Everybody not believe that? Well, at least we all agree, so we're either all right or wrong. <laughs> together. Okay, we're, we're in unity on this. Okay, um, uh, Christ alone endured the suffering, but the day is coming when all will acknowledge him as triumphant. Some in rejoicing and some in judgment. And we just talked about that um, as far as Christ on the cross. So in light of this, what is our assignment? Okay. Uh, we're yeah. I I that's what I wrote down to present Jesus to those we can while we can. And of course that goes sort of back up to the top of the page. Uh, this what can what can what can be toil, strain, and struggle and work. Okay. Um, and. Uh, God bless those who do it because I'm guilty of not doing it. I'll just tell you that. So it's, I guess I don't put it in toil and strain and struggle and work. But I'm glad for the Bedfords and all those who participate in VBS and all those who teach every Sunday here at church and all those who are ministering to their friends and neighbors and taking people in and spreading the word. It's, it's a ministry. It's a great thing. All right. Uh, we're done. Okay, so this is making up for all those Sundays that Pastor goes <laughs> because we're done 15 minutes early. So you can chat all you want uh, and do what you want, um, but we're done. Okay, we'll uh, pray. Father, I want to thank you for this lesson today about the triumphant suffering of Jesus and and. Uh, the contradiction in terms that that is, but how crucial that it is for us to understand that your suffering uh, results in triumph, not just for you, but for us. And so help us to understand fully uh, what uh, Isaiah prophesied and all the implications of what you, of what your design from the beginning was, from creation, as we read uh, from Genesis. There was a plan. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for Jesus. And so we um, pray that we'll uh, always remember uh, that um, for our salvation, for what we enjoy, someone 
suffer it and pay the price. And um, you know that that happens even today. But that sure happened on that day, mm -hmm. and we are so thankful for that. So thank you for your word, uh, words that I hope will uh, challenge us and encourage us uh, in our walk for you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.